following presentation was recorded at the Academy for Lifelong Learning. The Academy provides adults ages 50 and older a learning environment of continued personal and intellectual growth. These classes are held in either the East Montgomery County Improvement District Building or in the LSC Atascacita Center. For more information, please call 281-312-1750 or visit the website at lonestar.edu slash all-kingwood. Okay, down in Central America. Again, there's Nicaragua. All the, um, that still shows Panama and Belize. They, they didn't exist. By the, uh, by the way, England was involved. Despite what we uh, think about the Monroe Doctrine and how we're going to keep the Brit Europeans out, the British had a colony in Belize, British Honduras. They had islands out here that they controlled, and they controlled what is called the Mosquito Coast, part of Nicaragua. They just went in and took all of uh, the Mosquito Coast because they're thinking about building a canal as well. As I mentioned, there's a revolution, or not a revolution, but a civil war going on in Nicaragua. One other thing about all of this, and then we're going to get into the fighting. Nicaraguans, those who were fighting, meaning the, the conservatives and the liberals, loved Americans. If you talk about Central America today, you can't say that very often. But back then, they loved Americans because the Americans they had seen were Americans who were go-getters. They were going and getting the gold. They're passing through Nicaragua, a very backward country, and they're going to spend money while they're in Nicaragua, and then they're going to leave. You don't see any bad habits. Plus, if you're one of the, uh, rule, from the ruling families of Nicaragua, you admire how Americans have get up and go. Boy, if we just had some Americans in Nicaragua, they could get this country moving because we're already at the crossroads of, of uh, commerce. They're going to build a canal here. How wealthy can we be if we had some people who applied themselves? And the people in Nicaragua didn't. They were, they were happy in their villages. So they liked North Americans. The Civil War is going on, and the liberals the, the, they had two presidents, of course. Well, the liberal president decided to actually win the Civil War. He needed the help of some of those Americans that he admired so much. And he had heard of William Walker because people wrote about William Walker and his attempt to take Mexico. So he sent an agent up to San Francisco and they negotiated, and William Walker said, I'll bring 300 men down, and I'll help you. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot, but the population of Nicaragua was less than a quarter million people. And there's, that includes Indians who are never going to be involved in all of this. So their armies, when they talk about armies, uh, if you study this, they're talking about 3,000, an army of 3,000. Well, that's not even a division in America today. So uh, small numbers. So he's going to bring 300 men down. And that's what he does. He is not going to go down and declare himself president. He's working for one of the legitimate governments. Uh, he's working for the liberals. Um, this is from that movie I mentioned to, to some of you last uh, fall. There's a movie called Walker uh, with Ed Harris. This was made back in the 80s. Uh, it's not supposed to be a very good movie. I saw a portion of it, and I didn't like it. Uh, but William Walker arriving in Nicaragua, he's in the black, and that's typically how he dressed. Um, one newspaper said he looks like a grocer. <laughs> you know, he was very, uh, he was not, he was not imposing at all. He was about five foot five. Uh, again, he never spoke. 
uh, the most inspiring thing about him or unusual thing about his appearance were his eyes. He had gray eyes and they said they were very piercing. Um, and probably if all he did was stare at you because he didn't like to talk, that would be something you would remember. But anyway, he brought with him a group of men he called his immortals. A big army of 57 men. 57 men are his immortals. And they arrived in Nicaragua in May of 1855, working for the liberal government. But he's working for himself. From the beginning, he's got plans for Nicaragua. It's just that the Nicaraguans, the liberals, either thought they could control him or were naive enough to believe, well, he tried to take over Mexico, but he won't do that here. He is not a military genius. He loses his first battle. He, um, with his 57 men, he also had a, a small detachment of Nicaraguans. And what he did in all of his battles, except for one, is there's the town we need to take, charge. No planning, just go. Go, everybody, run up as fast as you can, because that's typically how they did it. They ran. They charged. And they run into the, the, uh, this town. And as soon as the firing started from the defenders, the Nicaraguans that were with them turned around and ran off. So now it was him and 57 others against the uh, conservative army that was there, which was probably about 1,000 men. So some of his men were killed. They were not immortal. And uh, they turned around and ran off. By the way, do you know why he called them the immortals in, in history? That's right. The, uh, the Persians had an army uh, that fought uh, in the Persian-Greek wars. And he called his special soldiers the immortals. So he's trying to call that up, Walker is, by calling them immortals. But they found out very quickly they weren't. Um, what he does understand, even though he's not a military genius, is that that lake covers a lot of ground. Wait a minute, can a lake cover ground? That would be, okay, uh, he, he was there. No. Well, that's true. There, thank you, you saved me. Um, you can move around very easily on the lake if you get one of Vanderbilt's boats. So what he did was he waited until one of the boats uh, came over with a crowd of gold seekers coming from uh, the Caribbean up San Juan River. They come into the lake and when they landed, he seized the boat. He puts his men on the boat and he sails up to the town or city of Granada. And Granada is uh, the oldest Spanish city in Central America. And nobody was expecting him. Uh, he's landing from the lake. Everybody, nobody had thought about using the lake that way. Well, I guess because they were American ships, they couldn't, the Nicaraguans couldn't control them. But Walker just took it over. And so he lands and he takes Granada. He lost one man in, in taking Granada. And Granada was the capital for the conservatives. And the conservative leaders had all their families there. And so he was able to take all these families hostage. And he just sent a note to the army, the conservative army, the leader of the army whose family was a hostage. And he said, uh, I'm going to execute them unless you surrender. He said, but if you surrender, we'll figure out a way to make this all work. And so there was a lot of pressure from other conservatives that said, you've got to surrender. We can't you know, have our families killed. And so the president, not the president, the, the general in charge of the, the conservative army surrendered. He came into Granada and he surrendered. And they made a deal. Walker made a deal. He said, I'm going to blend the two groups the liberals and the conservatives. So he chose a conservative as the president of the country. But who does he answer to? 
Walker. He's going to answer to Walker. Walker's calling the shots, but at least, you know, there's a, a beard. There's somebody up there who, who is a Nicaraguan uh, who's leading things. Uh, he then intermixed the rest of the liberals and the conservatives um, in various cabinets. The, the uh, general of the conservative army, he, uh, he was made the Secretary of Defense what they, they called it something else, but that's what it was, Secretary of Defense. And uh, Walker's in charge of the Army. So there's a Secretary of Defense, and Walker supposedly answers to him. But Walker has the Army now. He's in charge. Both sides, the liberals and the conservatives, are answering to him as far as the military is concerned. Some of those historians say that was the peak of Walker's career. At that point, he's running everything, and he's in no danger. Um, one historian said, but like a lot of would-be dictators, he was also impatient. So he's got to keep things heading towards him being called the leader. Uh, and the, the uh, Secretary of Defense is going to make it easy on him, because the Secretary of Defense was not happy answering to an Anglo. This whole view of, oh, we love North Americans is starting to change quite a bit. And so this guy, the conservative, who's Secretary of Defense, wrote a letter to one of the conservatives running Honduras. Remember I said they, they just work together all the time. So he wrote a letter to the, to the conservative government in Honduras saying, we got, this is horrible, we gotta change things. The letter was intercepted. It was given to Walker, and Walker was very unforgiving. He had this man executed publicly in a, a square in Granada. And that's, again, most historians say that's when he started losing his grip on power because this public execution kind of put everybody on notice. You people don't matter. What matters are the Americans that are here. So uh, killing him, and I think I have, oh. And he also alienated Vanderbilt because he took Vanderbilt's ship. For Walker, uh, I said he wasn't a military genius, but he still kind of understands how to get things done. But he doesn't understand business. He was never a businessman. He was a lawyer. He was a doctor. He becomes a chief, but he's not a businessman. And Vanderbilt went on vacation right before this occurred. Vanderbilt never went on vacation. He built a special yacht. It was the biggest ship in the world at the time, fastest moving uh, ship. And he went over to Europe for four months. While he was gone, and people even were uh, asking, are you sure everything's fine with your business? He said, oh, I've got it all handled. There's no problem with my business. Well, two people who own stock in the transit company involved in Nicaragua saw that as their opportunity to take over the transit company. And so through stock manipulation, they got control of the company. And then they went to Walker and they said, Vanderbilt is out. We're in. Support us. And Walker said, I'll do it. And he seized all of Vanderbilt's assets. I don't know how much you know about Cornelius Vanderbilt, but he took things personally. He would destroy you. That's, that was his attitude. Competition was always personal. I'll show you. You attacked me. So he makes Vanderbilt his enemy. He was assured Vanderbilt's, you know, he's out of the country. And actually, Vanderbilt had even resigned the presidency of the transit company. But that was just kind of a pro forma thing, because I'm going to be out of the country. Well, Walker thought it was going to be an easy thing. He did not count on Vanderbilt getting angry. OK, because when Vanderbilt heard about this, he wrote a little note to those two men who took over the transit company. This is one of his famous statements. Gentlemen, you have undertaken to cheat me. I won't sue you for the law is too slow. I'll ruin you.
yours truly, <laughs> Vanderbilt. Uh, he probably really didn't write that because he sued people all the time. He wouldn't have given up that leverage. But he, it's true that he wasn't going to wait on the law. But he, he was suing them at the same time. But this shows you, I mean, th this is the spirit of Vanderbilt. He's going to get you. Boy, those two guys picked on the wrong person. And poor old Walker just was ignorant of business and didn't understand that this was the first tycoon in American history. This guy never lost until the end of his life. Okay, um, I already mentioned Granada, and actually, you can't really tell this. It's the only thing I could find on the internet. But this is the execution of that general. If you look right here, you can see he's sitting in a chair. There's hundreds of people surrounding him. And oh, and one other thing, Walker chose a, a firing squad of Nicaraguans to do it. And they resented the fact that they were, they had to kill this Nicaraguan. Uh, from this point on, again, he's going to start kind of uh, losing his grip. Because when he did this, he also, uh, the president that he had uh, got nervous or didn't, decided he didn't like what uh, Walker had done. So he went over to Honduras. And now Walker, instead of picking some other uh, person to answer, you know, a figurehead, he just said, we're going to have an election. And it's amazing, he got almost all the votes, um, which probably was not true. But anyway, he's now the president of Nicaragua. And the, one of the first things he did was he introduced a new flag. This is not the flag of Nicaragua. It looks much like the flag of Nicaragua, except for the red star in the middle. And the red star in the middle scared, the five-pointed star scared lots of people in Central America because it is, there are five Central American countries. To the president of Costa Rica, what Walker is, is declaring is, I'm going to take over all five. That's why it's a five-pointed star. And that probably was his plan. Southerners are support, supporting him, thinking he's going to take over Nicaragua and give it to America. I do not believe that was ever Walker's plan. He was a megalomaniac. He's going to have his own empire down there. And in fact, he wrote a couple of letters that were exposed. Um, Vanderbilt got a hold of them, and he made sure they were published, that said, I'm not going to give up Nicaragua to the Americans. Uh, so anyway, this flag, though, that red star is a red flag for the president of Costa Rica. And he says, we can't have this Yankee running Nicaragua. We're going to go to war. His name was Juan Mora. He's the president of uh, Costa Rica. And he's going to send an army into Nicaragua. Uh, I wanted to point out something. Those are the flags, the modern flags of the five um, countries. Let's see. What did they have in common? Stripes. Well, this the stripes. What color are the stripes? Blue. Because the blue stripes represent the two oceans that they sit between. All, this, all the uh, flags of Central America, except Panama and Belize, uh, sit in, in a field of blue. And the white signifies the purity of the Catholic Church. So uh, now then they have their other emblems within those. And Nicaragua is the last one. And again, uh, what, what Walker did was he took away and it's some trees and I think an eagle. Uh, he took that away and he put in the red star instead. But anyway, Mora invades Nicaragua. And it's kind of interesting because, remember, I told you they didn't have a revolution to declare their independence. They didn't have a war of independence. So while William, William Walker is much more famous in Central America than he is in America, 
because Central Americans use the war against Walker as kind of their de facto independence. April 11th is Costa Rican Independence Day. They don't call it that, they call it something else, but it has to do with a battle against William Walker. He was the unifying force. He was what gave them a national identity. So they invade from the south and El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala combined their armies and invaded from the north. So he's being pushed from uh, two sides. And remember, I told you, Walker's not a good general. He was lucky. The, the one thing he did right was take that boat and go up to Granada. So you have a, uh, the war goes badly for Walker from the beginning. Uh, his men always charge. Even when they should be on the defensive, they can't wait. They were very impetuous. So they run out into fields of fire. Um, what you have here are two national heroes. This is the national hero of Costa Rica. Uh, April 11th is Santa Maria Day. And what he did, this is a statue of him. Um, there was a battle in one of the major cities of Nicaragua, and it's called Rivas. The um, Costa Rican army was pushing Walker and his men out of the city, or trying to seize the city. And Walker and his men had um, kind of barricaded themselves within some adobe buildings. And those streets, all the buildings are connected. It's like one long wall on each for a block. And then there's divisions within. So once you're in one of those buildings, you control the whole thing. To get to it, the Costa Rican general in charge had been shooting, you know, they'd been fighting all day uh, and they weren't making any progress, but um, the general, the Costa Rican general, asked for volunteers to set the buildings on fire. And nobody would volunteer because one thing that the Americans had over all the Central American armies was marksmanship. Those guys who went down there to fight in Nicaragua were marksmen. By the way, he, um, Walker's also still getting reinforcements. It's not just those original 57. If he wins a battle, more people come down from America. If he loses a battle, fewer people come by. But as long as those ships are coming, he's getting new people. Uh, anyway, they're in this long block of buildings, and uh, the general asked for volunteers and nobody stood up. So finally, a drummer boy, 14 or 15 years old, put down his drum and said, I'll do it. So he took the, uh, the torch and he ran across the square. Bullets are flying. He manages to get to the building and start a fire. And then, as he's running back, the Americans take aim and, and shoot him. So he sacrificed himself, he died, sacrificed himself to defeat Walker. And he is their national hero. Um, the building burned down, Walker had to escape, but he uses the, the lake. He's got a boat, he takes off. I had another battle where Walker uh, was not against the um, Hondurans and Guatemalans, um, the Americans found out where the, army, the Honduran army was. And they decided that they were going to attack them, even though they were far outnumbered. They're going to surprise them. So they surprised them by screaming and yelling as they ran towards them. <laughs> Uh, it's, by the way, it's the Battle of uh, San Jacinto or San, San Jacinto, uh, but not the one we're used to. That's, uh, it's a national shrine in Nicaragua. And uh, as the Americans charge, and you got, these guys really were brave. They weren't very bright, but they were brave because they were beaten off in the first attack. They regrouped. They charged again. The firing makes them stop, they go back, they regroup, and they come again. And 
they, on the third charge, they made it to, there was a, a hacienda that, that was kind of the goal. They made it to the hacienda and the fighting became uh, hand to hand. And an American came at Andres Castro, who was a Nicaraguan, uh, fighting with the Honduran army, uh, came at him with his sword drawn. He was going to just chop through him. And Castro had lost, or had run out of, of ammunition. So, as you can see here, he picked up rocks and began to throw them <coughs> at the guy with the sword. And when the guy with the sword got close enough, he brained him with a, a rock and killed him. He killed the American. And now, Hondurans and Nicar Nicaraguans both say that's what turned the tide of battle. When people saw that American go down, other Americans lost heart and turned and ran. And in this battle, it was a rout for the Americans. They took off and the Hondurans uh, went after them. By the way, he couldn't go after them because right after that he was shot in the lake. He did survive though. Um, they chased these guys down. And one thing about this war, there were no prisoners. Neither side took prisoners. They executed them. So they hunted down the Americans and only a few were able to escape. Any that they captured, they executed. And then this is the Battle of uh, Rivas also, which is where Juan Santa, Santa Maria fought. Uh, there was also a female hero. She was supposed to, um, they were using her house as a staging area this woman, and uh, they would charge out from her house. And at one point, right after Juan uh, Santa Maria started the fire, the general asked for more volunteers to set other fires. So a couple guys came out and said, we'll go. And when they took off, she got caught up in the moment. And she didn't have a gun. She didn't have fire. She just running with them. And she went out and she came back. So she's on, there's a, a big statue of several of them and she's on that statue as well. Um, so basically for Walker, he, uh, he can't seem to get a break at this point, except for the lake. And what he does is he goes south, if you think about a map of Nicaragua, that transit route is in the south of Nicaragua. As long as you've got that, you can get reinforcements. I mentioned that they keep coming down on those boats. He doesn't care about northern Nicaragua. As long as he's got the route taken care of. Oh, one other thing. Um, he, well, he's still president. So even though he's kind of on the run, he, um, he starts issuing decrees because he's the president. One of the first things he did was reinstitute slavery. Now I told you that personally he was against slavery. But he met with an American. By the way, his government was recognized by the US. It was a mistake, but it was. The uh, president of uh, the United States at the time, Franklin Pierce, uh, thought, he thought what he was recognizing was that uh, liberal government where he had the figurehead and so he recognized that but by the time the notice got there Walker was president. So Walker said see I'm legitimate and so they had to go through a big deal to to get rid of that recognition, withdraw the recognition. At the same time that happened a man from the south, an ex-congressman, came to Nicaragua and said if you want to survive you need to convince southerners that this is to their benefit to help you. So you need to institute slavery. You need to tell them it's about slavery. Because then we can think of Nicaragua as a possible state that will help us. So he reinstituted slavery. Now, he passed the decree. They didn't start bringing slaves in. But he had plans. He contacted the French government. He wanted to bring, uh, have the French bring the slaves over. Uh, he began to confiscate land. One of the things that the liberals had done to entice him and to entice the original immortals was to promise them land. After the war is over, any of you who survive, we're going to give you land. But the land they wanted to give them was the bad land. 
the land on the Mosquito Coast in, in areas that weren't nice haciendas where the liberals and the conservative Creos lived. What Walker did was he began to kick the Creos off their land. He began to confiscate that land and give it to Americans. Well, now the liber he's not going to have any Nicaraguans on his side because now to them, he's just going to take away our land. So he began to confiscate land and he also decreed that English was co-equal to Spanish, meaning that all the laws uh, were going to be translated into English. You were going to have uh, English courts and the Nicaraguans see that as, oh, they are uh, moving away from being Nicaraguan and it, we're just going to be a colony of the United States. And in fact, Walker was a racist. He wrote things that said, I don't like the Nicaraguan people. I don't like all those people. So we're going to, you know, we're going to rule them, but we'll have this as our own little fiefdom. But uh, so anyway, he institutes slavery. And there was a group called the Knights of the Golden <laughs> Circle, which unfortunately still exists. And I say unfortunately because it's not the same group, but it's basically the KKK of some kind. Uh, you can go on the internet and find stories about Walker where he's the big hero because he was helping slavery. Um, but the Knights of the Golden Circle had this dream that if things didn't work out with the United States, they would create an empire of slavery in a circle. And basically, if, if you think of it, uh, Havana on Cuba, which is right about there, I believe. Uh, this is a great circle. And all of that would be slavery. In case the, um, the North pushed against slavery, there'd be a new uh, republic, the Republic of the Golden Circle, and it would be slavery. So Nicaragua's right there in it. So he is trying to appeal to Knights of the Golden Circle. And people were coming down. They were volunteering, uh, even though, again, he personally was against slavery. Now Vanderbilt strikes. By the way, Vanderbilt sponsored the Costa Rican army and the Honduran army. They weren't, they didn't really have enough weapons, so he just bought their weapons for them. He sent them money, sent them $40,000, which was a lot back then to the Costa Rican uh, army. But the Costa Ricans, while they were in Nicaragua, were struck by a cholera epidemic. And it was horrific. They lost two-thirds of their army. Um, this is what saved Walker so that he can go down south and control the transit company. They had to retreat, and when they retreated, they took the cholera with them. So it wiped out even more of the Costa Ricans. So the Costa Ricans can't really fight Walker. Um, Hon the Hondurans were satisfied with what they had accomplished. So they, their army's not moving. And Vanderbilt wants his transit company working. So he hired his own mercenary, his own filibuster. Sylvanus Spencer. Sylvanus Spencer should have a book written about him. Uh, they said he was an orphan who grew up in a rough neighborhood, or at least it made him a rough child, because he was a kid of the streets. And he, when he got old enough, he went into the merchant marine or was working on uh, ships. And through hard work, he managed to make himself uh, a mate, first mate on uh, various ships. He'd tell you to do something. If you didn't do it fast enough, he would light right into you. Well, that works right up until the time you run into a captain who does the same thing. Because the captain can hit you. You can't hit the captain. And sure enough, he was on a trip where there was a captain who was very abusive to him. And it just kept going on and on. And finally, at the dinner table, the other officers are, or mates are sitting around. and. The uh, captain was saying something to, to uh, Spencer, and Spencer pounded his hands on the table, and he said, by God, I've taken more off of you tonight at dinner than I've taken off every other man alive. He said, put me off this ship, or one of us will die. 
The next morning, they found the captain dead. <laughs> wow, beaten to death. In fact, he found him. <laughs> Imagine that. So they took him back and they put him on trial, but no, they had, there were no witnesses. So he was acquitted. He certainly did beat him to death. He was acquitted, uh, but now he's not going to really be able to find work on a ship. Not too often. Uh, so he took passage on a ship and he went to Nicaragua. He'll take any kind of work. Uh, and he went to work for Vanderbilt's company, for the transit company, and uh, did all kinds of little things. But he's traveling up and down the San Juan River, learning the river, working on those paddle boats. And then when things, uh, when Walker has pushed out of northern Nicaragua and is just on the transit route, Spencer sees his chance. He leaves Nicaragua, goes to New York, and asks for an audience with Vanderbilt. Now, I think it's kind of interesting that Vanderbilt just said, oh, yeah, come on in. Now, who is this guy? And Vanderbilt's the richest man in America, but yeah, come on in. And this guy said, I have a plan. I know how to take back your property. And so Vanderbilt listened to it. He said, that's a good plan. And he gave him a bunch of money, thousands of dollars, to give to the president of Costa Rica. And I don't want to tell you what the plan is yet. I'm going to walk you through the plan. And the president of, of uh, Costa Rica said, that's a good plan. So he gave him some men. And they went, um, uh, Spencer and these uh, Costa Ricans crossed the border into southern Nicaragua. and the San Juan River's right there. And he snuck up on, this is called El Castillo. This is right above those rapids I showed you. Uh, it's a, because you have to slow down. It's a good place to guard. Walker has a heavy contingent of men there. They have cannons all pointed at the river. Spencer's a better general than Walker. Spencer went around. <laughs> He just walked up to the back of the castle, goes in, lines up, and all the guys are look they had some men down here on the river so that it would attract the attention of uh, Walker's men. And then they, the uh, Spencer's men lined up and just mowed down Walker's men, took the castle. <coughs> and he waited for the next paddle boat to come along. And when the paddle boat pulled up, because it, remember, it, it's got to kind of walk across those uh, rapids, Spencer went down. Spencer's been working on the river. He knows all about the ships, all about the boats. He knows what signals are used. He knows who's the captain. So he just said, hey, Captain John, how are things? Oh, hey, Spencer, how are you? I'm fine. Can I come aboard? Sure, come on came on board and seized the ship. And he then went up and down the San Juan River seizing property for Vanderbilt. He goes down to the, the Caribbean coast and he captures the um, port for Vanderbilt. Now no one can come from New York and help Walker. He then sailed up the San Juan River to the lake seized the last steamboat on the lake because, the, again, the captain uh, came up to, uh, what was the town? I think it's called San Carlos. But anyway, the, the boat pulls up and he just waved at him. He goes, hey, Spencer, how are you? I'm fine. Why don't you come up on, on this boat? And the captain of that boat came onto Spencer's boat. They captured him. Now he controls every ship that Walker needs for reinforcements. Walker brings all his men into one city. The Hondurans come down. They, start, they lay siege to the city for three months. They don't really have to do anything except starve him out. I mean, they don't let him out. He, he can't go out on the lake anymore. That had been his way out all the time. Now he can't go out on the lake. And so finally, after three months, 
he has to surrender, but he won't surrender to the Hondurans. So Spencer contacted the U.S. Navy, and a Navy, a U.S. Uh, naval officer came in and negotiated, and Walker surrendered to the Navy. And his men are allowed, he, Walker and his men are allowed to get on a Navy ship and are transported back to the United States. So he's out of Nicaragua. So's Vanderbilt. He said it's too unstable. I'm not going to do that anymore. He made a deal with uh, the uh, steamship company sailing through Panama, and he's going to make money doing that. Walker has survived, though. So he said, I'm going back. And he ran around the south looking for people to help him. He got a shipload of people, and then the U.S. Navy stopped him off the coast of, New York, of Louisiana. And so he said, well, that's not good, so I'm going to go back. And he started again, planning to go to Nicaragua. And then he was contacted by a group of British colonists. Remember I told you there were some islands off Honduras that the British controlled? Well, the British colonists were afraid that the British were about to leave, that they were going to give those islands to, the, to Honduras. And the British subjects did not want that to happen. So they convinced Walker to come down and lead a rebellion. And they said, you can be president of our islands. So he went down to Honduras and was immediately captured by the British. And the British said, look, the Americans have let this guy off three times in Mexico, the first time in uh, Nicaragua, and then when he was sailing out of Louisiana. Let's give him to the Central Americans. And they gave him to the Hondurans, and they executed him in 1860. So he died uh, in Central America. Oh, I forgot to tell you about that. There's his... Um, his stone where he was shot. There's also his grave, which is in Honduras. Uh, I do want to, I'm going to have to go back to that. I forgot about this. He, uh, Walker wasn't there, but Walker kind of had a special place for Granada where he had become president. So his way of showing that he had a special place in his heart for Granada was to destroy it. Yes. When he realized he was not going to continue to control Granada, he ordered his, uh, this gentleman, he was a British uh, soldier of fortune, uh, Henningsen, to destroy Granada. And um, even as the Hondurans were coming in and laying siege to the city and his men were dying, he was like a robot. No, he's going from, from house to house putting in charges to blow up the city and to burn it. Uh, did such a good job. This is one of the few buildings from that era still standing. The cathedral, you can see it's all marked up and stuff. But as he left, he, he wrote this in Spanish, but he placed a big banner uh, for the Hondurans to find that said, here was Granada, because it had ceased to exist. Uh, no reason to do it except spite. Destroyed the, the uh, town. Uh, two movies have been made about Walker. I mentioned the first, uh, the one uh, with Ed Harris, which is, it has moments, but basically it's a pretty bad movie. But Marlon Brando also made a movie where he plays Sir William Walker. They changed it up somewhat, but it's really about William Walker. Uh, but he plays, he's a Brit, uh, British soldier of fortune, and it's an island in the Caribbean. And, but it's pretty much the same story. Uh, the movie is called Burn, Burn, Burn. And it was made in the late 60s. Uh, I haven't seen it, but just from the trailers and stuff I've seen, late 60s, Marlon Brando, it was a little surrealistic, I think, um, before he came back with Godfather. So, uh, Walker has, uh, has appeared in uh, lots of romance novels and other novels. Uh, one romance that came out in the 70s, uh, he was a woman. Because he was a very slight man, and uh, you could see he, was all, he, he looked very youthful, so they decided that he was a woman who was uh, hiding. Um, 
He, others came out saying that he was gay because he wrote affectionate letters. But I think I've, we've had this conversation before. Men wrote more affectionate letters back then. It was not unusual to share a bed with someone else and to hug them and say, I missed you and I want to kiss you because you showed affection back then. So the idea that he's not, or that he was gay, uh, I don't believe. Because I think it was the death of his fiance that kind of made him, I'm no longer a, a person with personal feelings. I am this movement. I am going to be something bigger than I was before. He was 36 when he died. Um, he was th 34 when he was uh, president. And she wa or he was in his late 20s when she died. I, and I'm not sure how old she was. She uh, could not hear or speak. And they said she was beautiful, but she couldn't hear or speak, so she did not have, um, she didn't have a large range of friends. And he had met her because he was a doctor. And so they fell in love. The later immortals, the, the reinforcements that came in, brought in sharps. Uh, the, the armies that were fighting him were typically just muskets, and some of them very old muskets. That was what originally attracted me to Walker, was how is it that 57 guys can conquer a country? What's going on here? And you have to start looking in, and I, I don't really think it was the technology that allowed him to win. It was the fact that the people were divided and that most of the people didn't care. Um, I was reading one source that made it very plain that um, most of this fighting that occurred in Nicaragua did not include Nicaraguans, or people from Costa Rica, people from Honduras and El Salvador. Um, those people who brought him in, sure, they, uh, they were on his side initially, but the people who fought in the Nicaraguan army were all drafted. You gotta come or we're gonna burn your village. And so they were always willing to leave uh, very quickly. So I think it was the fact that he was unified and they had a purpose and um, maybe because they would die if they didn't win. I mean, th that's all they could do. You either fight and conquer or you're destroyed. Because I can't find anything that shows why he's so compelling. Even people who admire him just say, well, he was steadfast. But why people would be willing to, to die for him, I don't think they were dying for him. I think they were <coughs> dying for themselves. It was an opportunity. They could get rich. Um, the ones who believed in slavery were going to spread slavery. And it was a heroic age. People believed in heroes. And you do this kind of thing. Why else would they all charge? I mean, over and over, they'd see their friends dying, and then they'd just do it again. The reinforcements are all Americans who come in. Um, he had some Nicaraguans on his side, but, oh, in, in fact, he made a point. He said, I don't want draftees. They have to be people who have volunteered. So it was always a smaller number, whereas the other, uh, the, like the conservatives, would have uh, a larger army, but they'd be draftees. So there was always people with a purpose. He was very quiet. They said he didn't talk uh, much at all. Uh, as far as, uh, it was actually in Scotland, but I don't, I don't know what university when he went to, uh, and, and he went to Germany too for his medical uh, education. But no, that's the thing. They don't talk about him being compelling. I, I can understand there are certain people that you just, you listen to them and you go, yeah, I'll do whatever you say. He was not that. He was not a politician. It, and that's why I think it was the times, because everybody believed in Manifest Destiny. Everybody from the South believed that it was necessary to spread slavery. Everybody believed that people in, in Nicaragua were, were uh, inferior to people in America. So we're just spreading democracy to them. All those things gave them a mindset that said, we can take this country. It wasn't him. It, it, I, I couldn't put my finger on it. Let me put it that way. Now, by the way, he, 
uh, gray-eyed man of destiny. He gave himself that, <laughs> that name. He, they wrote plays about him. Uh, people, some people in the North didn't like him, but overall Americans thought of him as a big deal. He was just completely overshadowed by the Civil War. That came, I mean, he died in 1860. And then we had a whole different group of heroes to think about, which is why I said you can't really, uh, no other time was filibustering going to be like it was in the 1850s. That was a special time for that. But yeah, that's right. They, they mentioned him in that. Uh, I was reading a book. There's a, actually a book about William Walker and his influence on literature. Because, it, uh, because two movies about him and all these other, there's a lot of characters who have different names but are really based on what he did because he is the most successful of these filibusterers or, or whatever it is because <laughs> um, nobody else managed to become president. There's a good book about all this called Tycoon's War, uh, which is from both Vanderbilt and uh, and Walker's point of view, but they say he admired Sam Houston, so when he became president, what this author said is he had to be thinking, just like Sam, I'm now the president of my own country. So. LSC-TV strives to enrich our viewers' lives with programming designed to increase awareness of local events and issues. LSC-TV also produces informational videos about the various programs offered at Lone Star College Kingwood. Finally, LSC-TV's broadcast is designed to educate and inform our audience on a variety of subjects with both locally and nationally produced programming. To see our current programming schedule, please visit lonestar.edu slash lsctv. Lone Star College participates in the National Model United Nations New York. Over 5,000 college, university, and graduate school students from around the world participate every year. National Model UN New York is considered to be the most prestigious and most competitive level of Model United Nations. Lone Star College is one of the few community colleges accepted into the National Model United Nations New York. Model United Nations, to me as a definition, is a mock conference of what happens with the real United Nations. You come together with uh, with students from around the world. You conduct a lot of research prior to getting there, and then once you arrive at the Model United Nations, you put all your research to, you know, to work. We're like, as an international community, come up with one solution or for different pro problems, and each country has to contribute different uh, perspectives on that, on that problem. So, and we came along together to solve that issue. Model UN is UN. Um, to me, it wasn't a model. I felt like I was part of the UN for those four or five days. Model the United Nations is an academic simulation of the United Nations that aims to educate participants about current events, topics in international relations, diplomacy, and the United Nations agenda. The participants role play as diplomats representing a nation in a simulated session of the United Nations. Participants research a country, take on roles as diplomats, investigate international issues, debate, deliberate, consult, and then develop solutions to world problems. It's a, it's a com very competitive program and each of us get graded in each committee. You have to have some certain set of skills in order to be uh, successful in those um, like um, debate skills, communication skills, presentation, diplomacy, knowledge. In terms of preparing, it was lots and lots of research um, in terms of knowing the country that we, we represented being Ukraine. Um, we had to know about Ukraine as a country, their political values, their culture, their society. We had to become Ukraine. Like I was no longer from England and I no longer lived in Houston, I was Ukraine. When I learned about what the United Nations program even was, um, an opportunity to go to New York and um, learn a little bit about how the whole system worked, 
I decided to go ahead and apply. Students should participate in Model UN because it promotes interest in international relations and related subjects, increases the capacity for students to engage in problem solving, fosters the development of leadership skills, improves students' public speaking abilities, teaches aspects of conflict resolution, research skills, and communication skills, and creates the opportunity to meet new people and make new friends. Participation in the Model UN can provide scholarship opportunities as well. It's a rewarding experience for um, anybody. You don't have to have a particular interest in politics. Um, anybody could do it. It's rewarding for everybody, but you definitely need to be dedicated. I think the type of person that should join the Model UN is the kind of person that has an interest in international studies, a person that has an interest in international conflict, and a person who just who would like to see the world become a better place. The popularity of Model UN continues to grow, and today more than 400,000 middle school, high school, and college university students worldwide participate every year. Many of today's leaders in law, government, business, and the arts participated in Model UN during their academic careers. The main thing that I took away was a sense of accomplishment, a sense of um, knowing that I'm a better person because of National Model United Nations, I'm a better person because I participated. Who do I think should join? Everybody. I think that you should at least take an account to at least ask somebody about it and learn as much as you can about the United Nations. It is a, a mind-blowing experience. The Lone Star College Police Department has a mission to provide a secure environment and to serve the needs of the Lone Star College system's students, staff, faculty, and property. We strive to maintain an environment that is conducive to learning, teaching, and working by being vigilant and alert for criminal activity and other circumstances that might threaten our community. We employ both commissioned police officers who have the same powers and abilities as any other police officer as well as non-commissioned security guards. In all aspects, our department offers the same resources as any other police department in the community. Some of our police duties and powers are the protection of life and property, enforcement of law, deterrent of crime, reception of statements of incident, the creation and support of crime prevention and victim assistance programs. However, the Lone Star College Police Department offers much more than your local law enforcement agency. In addition to providing a full range of police services, we offer community-friendly assistance, such as walking and cart-driven escorts, motorist assists, such as car jumps and walkouts, safety information, and even lost and found. It is crucial to our mission of service that the community we serve knows that we are available and open to your questions, requests, and emergencies. If you have any concerns, please approach any of our police officers or security guards that you see patrolling our campuses on foot, on bicycles, in golf carts, or in marked police cars. They will be happy to talk with you and will either provide you the information you need or we'll direct you to someone else for help in resolving your issue. The Lone Star College Police Department is operational 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Our emergency communication center may be reached by phone at any time by calling 281-290-5911 or by dialing 5911 on any campus phone. And finally, the Lone Star College Police Department would like you to remember that everything we do is ultimately for the following the protection of life, property, and investment, security of the campuses, the pursuit of excellence in campus law enforcement and safety, and service to the students, staff, and faculty. 
Thank you for watching. We want your experience with Lone Star College System to be positive, pleasant, and above all, safe.